Hello and welcome. This is Far Warsaw. It's way down the bottom on Speedwell Island, and for Ansys, this is where we're operating from for much of the Falklands for this current campaign. Today we're going to learn how to use the RB04 simplified anti-ship missile. I say simple because it's um well it's simpler than the RB15. And when you're just starting out, or if you have a mass target to hit, or you have restrictions, like we do in our campaign, the RBO4 is a great weapon. So I'm just setting everything up for the startup. And let's grab our weapons. Now, a quick note. Make sure when you grab... I mean, I've, I've got a preset here. Make sure you have RBO4 written like that. Not... Where is it? Here we go. For AI. Because it'll work differently and probably won't work for you. We'll grab some fuel. It's a longish flight out there. While everything turns on, we're going to make our flight plan. This is Speedwell Island. We're going to set this as a fixed point. Very rough. Good to have something here we can recalculate our navigation based off. Now, we're going to say the, e the intelligence for this convoy here is completely wrong. So we'll put it right in the middle of N November Delta. And make it an M point. So remember, M points are, we're able to fix and change their location without changing the whole flight plan. So, very simple flight plan today. Okay, computer's good. Let's just see if I can cycle through my friend's cartridges and find my own. That looks like today's. Let's load it, load it in. There we go, we have a, a cartridge and a flight plan. Let's just verify that for a second, so position output. Remember to change waypoints, we've got to be an ACTPOS output. Two, one, two, seven, looks about right to me. Let's fly, so back to LS. We must be in your LS mode, so landing skew when you take off, otherwise the alignment that occurs won't really work. We've got our weapons, don't we? Yes, we do, looking fine. I should say that the uh, roads in the Falklands map are a little bit dicey for uh, road base operations, such that we've currently suspended them while our training gets better. But today the wind is pretty good, although we've got a bit of a tailwind on takeoff, it will certainly help us on the landing. So, you'll notice here we can't even see the white boxes just yet. So, we're going to work out what we're doing. There they are. Okay, RBO4 are somewhat heavy and somewhat draggy, so as always, full power. Just gonna adjust my track IR. Again, we want to be lined up down the runway as best we can, like that. Otherwise, our compass will not align properly. The downhill will give us a bit of extra speed, but we'll have to rotate a bit more to get off the road. So let's do that now. There we go. And we're up and away. Quick reminder, you really want to stay in afterburner until you see 550. Um, you make up the uh, the, uh, the turn time by being faster. Delta Wing's working for you and not just becoming a massive drag sink. 550, back to burner 1. Oh. On the way over to target, I'm going to show some radar stuff. Because we do have other ships ahead of us. And I'm going to mute... The radar warning receiver. The radar radar warning receiver. That's just down here. This switch here. So Lewis, I think, is lights, and Lyud is like loud or sound. So just down to Lewis. So we'll get the lights on on our radar warning receiver, but, but we won't really get the uh, the beeps. So a couple of things to notice. We turn the radar on, and we're getting some very strong jamming strobes. You guys see that? So you can play with the gain a bit to try and work them out, but in short. I actually find jamming strobes are quite useful for locating ships. They uh, very much give away their location. So let's see. Our fixed point is behind this, this ship over here. Now I know it's a Grisha. Essentially it's a ship with a uh, SA-8 on it. So radar back off. Now we know that SA-8s are relatively short ranged radar guided missiles. So we might even have a chance to uh, demonstrate some missile evasion techniques in the begin. So when you're flying into a, a hostile, you can, a hostile, 
a hostile controlled area. If the word hostily is ever a word, then it won't be my doing. Um, having a lot of having a high amount of speed and energy coming into the target really helps. Now, because we usually operate very low, we can't really dive to get energy as often. So we want to really be at high subsonic mark on the way into target, which is what we're aiming to do here. And even with a fairly heavy payload, the Vigan's usually pretty good enough kinematics wise to evade missiles like this if you act soon. So we're actually going to fly deliberately into this, just see him there, to the right of the HUD bracket. That's a Grisha warship. We're going to fly and deliberately put ourselves in harm's way of this missile and evade. So we'll listen to our radar warning gear, boost the volume. That's not a good sign. Let's see if he's launched. Has he launched? Not yet, but he's tracking us. So if you get tracked like this, full burner, position off nose. We want to reduce our closure rate, start building up our energy, and I'm diving to get a bit more energy too. Let's see if we can spot the ship. There it is. If he fires, we should be able to kill the missile. There it is, missile out. So flying 90 degrees to the launcher. That's going to make that missile do all the work it can. Keeping low. There it is. Now watch this. We're going to pull up smoothly. Pull, 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 pull. And let the kinematics of the Vigan handle the rest. Look up how high we go. Alright. And we can sort of also zoom climb. There we go. Missile detonated. So that missile lacked the energy to deal with us. So yeah, very cool. The trick is to act soon. Don't, don't wait around waiting for this... Uh, you know, you want to make your defensive maneuver as soon as possible. Anyway, I'll just time accelerate a little bit to get us towards the target. And getting towards, I just had a horrible thought if he fired while I was in time acceleration, this would be a very short flight. Okay, we should be getting towards the point where we can see these, these ships on radar. Let's have a look. Autopilot on. Let's go heads down and have a look through the radar. Clear as day. Look at that. I would imagine they're going to start jamming soon. But while we've got a clean scope, let's fix just ahead of them. There we go. So now I can shut off the radar and be entirely stealthy. Let's rocket ourselves down to the ground. Bearing in mind that it's hard to judge how high you are when it's just ocean. So there we go. Get ourselves nice and low on the deck. And let's talk about the RBO-4. So, it's a very simple missile. It essentially works always in a mad dog sort of mode. When you fire it, it flies along the heading you launched it on, and it finds the brightest ship it can, and then it sinks it. There is no IFF, as far as I'm aware, with this missile. It will hit whatever is out ahead of you. So, be, be mindful of that. Secondly, there, there's a switch back here which we have to know about. Now, in most cases, this switch is never touched. The group and ankle switch, that mind me just looking down while we're whizzing across the water at Mark 0.9, that's, that's quite normal for a vegan. Most times, this switch means just one thing, value or standard. So, for weapons that have uh, sort of computer codes that change how they operate, you usually leave this in value. You can kind of revert to standard, but for the RBO4, it has a second function group mode and ankle single mode. We're keeping it simple today, so for a simple mission, leave this guy on ankle at all times. In group mode, the missile tries to be smarter than it really is, uh, and it's actually a very intricate missile, there's lots to read. I'm going to put a link for a really interesting post in the description for you to look at. It's actually a very uh, impressive missile for its time, but this missile is attempting to get past picket ships or defensive escorts and hit convoy members within the convoy. So it, it ignores single ships and waits for a vertical stack, I believe it is, of ships. Now, I have tested this missile and I almost never get hit, so I leave it in group mode. You really... I can't think of a scenario, I set up a very specific one, where you would want to use it in group mode. When in doubt, use ankle mode and... yeah. The problem will be, of course, that our missiles will likely find the first target and both hit the same target, which is not great. Um, you could flick this switch here down to impulse from series. 
Ceres fires all the missiles, imp Impulse fires them one at a time. But that's a pretty heavy and draggy missile. It's like a small plane on its own. Firing just one is quite destabilizing. Um, but you could fire one and then change the heading a few degrees to the right and fire the next one. And that would allow you to spread your efforts across multiple ships. But my thinking is it's not worth doing that. I would much rather... I'm just switching to ANF now and popping the radar on. I would much rather hit one ship very, very hard and sink it than damage two ships. But your situation may vary. I'm just showing the, the normal case of what would normally be done. Okay. Yeah, so the jamming's covered up those ships now. So in this case, the jamming is neatly covering up all the ships in a line. Engaging from the, from the side here would probably mean that the, the ships couldn't jam across. But our position's probably pretty good still. The ships can't have moved that much. You'll notice that once we switch to ANF, which I did without telling you, and the radar comes on, you'll see... Thank you, phone, for beeping when I'm doing a, uh, a video. Um, yes, you will see the, these two little brackets, these two little lines here, forming a wedge shape. Essentially, putting a ship in this wedge shape will mean you will hit likely that ship. So, there's no real reason to actually put a fix down besides just your own help, your own sort of logic. Um, the range 2 will also appear up here, range to waypoint, so that, that can help you judge. It's roughly... Oh, I think you can get it down to about a 15k shot, but we'll, we will see. I'll actually check this out now while I'm flying. But if you see a ship visually, point and shoot at it, you'll probably sink it. It's a very simple weapon to use. I'm going to unpause now. Let's have a look. And uh, we can probably descend a bit lower too. Right now, our altimeter says that we are at zero meters, which is a good healthy height. We can't release this lower, else the missiles will go straight into the deck. Well, yeah, into the water. So we kind of want to pop up to about 50 meters and release. That's the recommended height. And, uh, yeah. By approaching this low, and ideally with the radar off, we also aren't very easy to track and engage. But this missile's range is not really long enough to engage carriers, carriers in their groups. So for Grisha's, it's, it's fine. And this convoy is defended by Grisha. It's saying we're at max range now, so I reckon about 24 kilometers is a good max range judgment for this weapon. We're in range, trigger unsafe, we've got a red light saying we're out of parameters, 50 meters, now we're in parameters, pulling the trigger, bruiser twice, two missiles gone, there they go, let's hit the burner and get out of here. So there's no reason for us to stay any longer, the missiles are completely autonomous, and we will head back to B1 to do a radar fix. But you guys want to see what happens when these missiles hit their targets, don't you? So let's add about a one, five degrees of climb, and watch them go in. They look really cool. You see they kind of separate out to make a defensive fire less effective. Small things like this. This is why Swedish weapons are just so cool. There's an extra layer of thought. Yep, missile on the left has found its target. Missile on the right probably has the same one. And my guess is it's that lead Grisha. Looks like it is. Let's have a look. For the best camera angle, we'll go external to the ship. See if we can spot the ship. Imagine you're on this ship and you see that coming towards you. Thump thump. Damaged odd normally it sinks them maybe the angle wasn't great personally i'd rather hit a ship from the side but yeah normally these are pretty reliable kills on ships certainly in pairs they are trigger safe back to nav now i think i've mentioned radar fixes before but probably wise to mention them again right now we've got oh just clicked over two kilometers of drift estimated by the system so we want to clear that drift remember we put b1 in our cartridge on this little on this cartridge on this little island just here. So let's see if we can acquire the island and do a quick fix. That jamming is not helping, so we will have to deal with that. I might even try and lower the radar elevation to hide that jamming out. If I'm very deft, I can probably do it. Up a little half notch. Nope. Deary me, everyone's texted me today. It's always when I record. It's becoming a trope 
in our Baldur's Gate playthrough. So see here, the system believes that this is where the... Oh, that shuddering is so bad. So sorry. system believes this is where Waypoint 1 is. And that's how much our INS has drifted, how much our navigation system has drifted. Flying over the ocean, there's no real chance for turn nav or for visual fixes or really anything. Um, you could try and fix off a boat, but that'll likely move. So in truth, flying over the ocean pretty much guarantees you'll get some kind of nav drift. So coming back home, make sure you have some kind of location like this to quickly fix the drift. There we go. Navigation is all good. Now this little counter down here, which shows how much drift we have, right now it says zero, it will always re respond, it'll always, always reflect to zero once you've done a fix of any sort. It assumes you know what you're doing, so yeah. And now to get home a bit faster, let's uh, go into full burn. And uh, let's see how I go flying over a Grisha. Directly over. Because I think every training training mission should include some bad decision making. Because you can learn a lot from seeing someone do something foolish. It said the Vigan can go twice the speed of sound up high. And in our testing we found that so long as you stay below, I think it's 13 or 14,000 meters. Which corresponds to roughly 46,000 feet. As long as you stay below that you will have no issues with, um, with, the, with the afterburner. The afterburner will normally cut out above those altitudes. So, one thing to note, we're getting no beeps here, but we know there's a hostile ship ahead of us. We're, our pitch is so high right now that the radar energy is hitting the bottom of the jet. It's not hitting where the RWR aerials are, which I believe are in the, the nose, in the, um, the wing pods. On the leading edge, on the leading edge, just there. So um, just be mindful of that. You may find you're being fired on, and uh, not realise it. So we'll nose over a bit. Of course, if we are fired on at this speed, the biggest risk really is uh, us ripping the wings off in our haste. So just be mindful. Everything done gradually at these sort of speeds, and we really are moving. So I assume we're about to fly over that SA. Yeah, it's off to our left somewhere down there. Might even just be able to see him, a ship down there. I mean, engaging a, an aircraft flying this fast is pretty difficult. So we're well inside the weapons cone, but that, if you imagine actually it's not really a, a weapons cylinder, it's a weapons uh, dome. Of course when I'm re recording a loud bike goes past. This ship has to shoot so far uphill to hit us that it's probably not going to be able to launch and even if it does, a very minor course change will be well outside of its threat range. Yeah, we're past the 90 degrees, so it's only going to get harder for him to hit us. And let's see. No. Look at that. The um, launches themselves, the actual, um, I guess, pylons, the little looped pylons for the RBO4, are themselves quite draggy. So normally we would be seeing a higher speed here, but it's still pretty good. Let's switch to landing nav and see how our landing's going to go. We're actually on heading for landing right now, so that's, uh, that's good. I'm going to do an overhead brake. So, throttles to idle. And, uh, just gonna follow my cues on the ADI, honestly. Remember, too, even if your INS is pretty well bugged up, as long as you can get within the cone of your tills, you will actually get an automatic fix for, um, the, for your location relative to the landing point. The ILS signal will actually fix your nav off you. And we can also do a quick run on the radar and see, yep, my red bases do show up very bright on radar as radar returns, so you can quickly see that that's in the right position. So our fix was pretty good. And now we've got a tills, so we've actually had it fixed automatically. Uh, we're a bit high and a bit fast to be attempting a 
straight in landing. Uh, let's have a think. I don't think we're going to get slow enough fast enough. We could deploy the air brakes, but they're fairly useless. Let's do that. That little green light down the bottom, Luftbroms. That's, uh, yeah, Luft is air. Broms, I guess, is some kind of like brake or barrier. Again, green warning lights aren't a problem. So, for example, our gear will show up as green. I think we're actually about to... Yes, there's our road base. We're definitely not going to make it. What we'll do, we will fly past and say hello and then do a... Oh, I'm trying to think what it's called now. Is it initial in pitch or... You know what I mean. The standard landing. This reminds me of being in a uh, ME163 and coming back you know, burnt off our fuel engines off, essentially, and then just coming back in a big high-speed glide, hopefully with no uh, Mustangs or Tempests behind us. Right to lose ILS, and there it goes. Pop. All right, beginning the initial, the uh, in the break, I should say. Adding a bit of power. Arming reverser. As I said, this base is not exactly the easiest to land on, so even if I do crash it, I will leave the video on so you can see. Maybe you can learn from my mistakes, but I, I usually find I can land pretty well as long as I'm focused. Turning final, reverse resarmed gear is in transit, we might just switch to landing PO, we know what we're doing, theoretically. And these roads are very narrow, even more narrow than the ones that say on the Caucasus, so precision is important. We'll see if I can reflect that in my landing now. There we go. As we roll wings level, we should get a surge of lift. There it is. We want to put that steering dot, that datum dot, on the road base like that. Good. And now line up our flight path marker. And because the base is kind of uphill, I'm going to be pitching to... There we go. Sort of a flare, actually, at the end. So that's a little lesson now effective... And down, full power on for the reverser using the brakes to steer, and we are down safe. The uphill does help with our deceleration, and that's without any real braking besides just for direction. And we got it home safely. And you can see just how little room there is either side of the wheel. So this is a, a risky base, but I will be posting this mission as Operation Gaia for you to take a look at. Maybe you guys can tell me what you think of it. It includes... Harry's at this base too, so which I, which I think is very appropriate. All right, and that is RB05, sorry RB04, anti-ship missiles. Uh, next up, I think we will, we will do. Uh, haven't decided yet actually. Maybe RB05, the uh, manually controlled missile, because they're a lot of fun and have some useful applications. Anyway, thanks for your time, and I'll see you at the next one. G'day, Greg.